Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 145th video cast, 135th podcast for the week ending July 28th, 2022. My wife's birthday, so this is going to be shorter than normal. Uh, anyway, wanted to, uh, we'll start off with the media quick, and we've got a lot of great stuff to cover. So thanks for tuning in. First, I'd like to thank Ellie Terrett and Liz Clayman and Finley Walker for having me on the Claim and Countdown on Tuesday. We'll cover that uh, in a bit. Also want to thank Asia Celestino, Ali Thompson, and Ellie Park for having me on Cheddar on Tuesday uh, to discuss Microsoft earnings, big tech earnings, etc. And finally, I want to thank Ellie Terrett and Ashley Webster, as well as Liz Clayman for having me on the Claim and Countdown on Friday, uh, where we pointed to if we got the second quarter of GDP, the market would actually rally. And I'm looking, the S&P is up, uh, I think, actually 300. Anyway, the S&P is up today. The, Na the Dow is up today. The NASDAQ's up today. Uh, and everyone was pretty pessimistic going into this. And bad news is good news, and we'll talk about why. Uh, I want to thank Ellen Chang, who did this great article on semiconductors and how the auto chip supply is coming back online. Click here to read it at thestreet.com. Uh, and on to the next. So we're going to cover, do some China updates, uh, China and Alibaba updates, and then move to the general market article of the week and then ask me anything questions. We've got a few good ones. So uh, first, Beijing plan strategy to avoid... U.S. market delistings. There's a lot of um, confusion going back and forth about this. Our thesis has never been related to whether they stay listed in the U.S. or they don't stay listed in the U.S. We own it in Hong Kong now. The shares are fundable. If you own the ADS in the U.S., you can switch out to Hong Kong for a nominal fee with your broker. Um, if you own the options, you can exercise the options, buy the stock, and then switch it out to uh, Hong Kong. So uh, there's a lot to do there. Uh, then the China regulator denied the report. Usually what we find is every time they deny, it happens a few months later. Uh, maybe this time will be different, but I doubt it. Uh, China's contrarian view, uh, Citibank's contrarian view on China. Economy is turning the corner. Feels like a moment of capitulation, says Snyder. Well, that moment was in March. Where were you back then? But nonetheless, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So more and more uh, sell side houses are coming around to uh, the idea of investing in Chinese equities. Uh, Chinese China says G leaders got local shots and rare disclosure. Okay, uh, well, they're obviously not working or you wouldn't be having the shutdowns. Uh, China bulls say July's slide is a blip as worst is over for stocks. Now, keep in mind, this was after the best week in Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, so opinion follows trend this week, uh, this weekend, the articles will be more negative because you had a, a softer week this week. Uh, and so the game goes, but, uh, Fidelity and GAM say, uh, China equities may outperform in the second half earnings estimates for China, Hong Kong stocks are on the rise. That is key. Uh, so the estimates are coming off those J June lows where everyone was panicked because of the, uh, earlier in Q2 shutdowns uh, due to COVID and the zero COVID idiocy policy, uh, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, Hong Kong listed firms from 10 cents to cents time push stock buybacks to new heights to defend valuations. So the pace of buybacks uh, has been accelerating um, in Hong Kong. Uh, let's see here. What else did they say? 10-year high after a rocky start to the year. The repurchases have amounted to 5 billion U.S. dollars, 39.5 billion Hong Kong dollars, already surpassed the 5 billion recorded in all of 2021. It's the most since 2011. Uh, and expect that to continue. Why? Because the government is pushing them to do it, and they do what the government says in a communist economy. Uh, Alibaba applies for primary listing in Hong Kong. So people viewed this to say they're hedging in case they uh, uh, get delisted in the U.S. That may be part of it. But uh, if you read this note uh, and many others like it, uh, these are the guys that run the K-Web ETF, the largest China, largest China, Brendan Ahern, largest China um, Internet ETF in the U.S. 
He said, Alibaba announced overnight its board of directors has decided to apply for a primary listing in Hong Kong. The company's current listing in the city is only a secondary listing. After this process is complete, Alibaba shares will have primary listings in both New York and Hong Kong. This is good news for many reasons, including the fact the company's share will be made available on the southbound Stock Connect, opening them up for an investment from mainland-based individuals and institutions. My uh, junior analyst, uh, Carter, pointed this out a couple months ago ahead of all of the, this happening. The expectation that it was that it would happen uh, much later uh, and it's happened sooner. So this will add incremental buyers, maybe about $10 billion of buying power for a $300 billion market cap. It's not a game changer, but it will incrementally help uh, and add new buyers. This will also open the stock up to new pools of capital and additional liquidity. We believe this could also allow long-only portfolio managers to take a position in Alibaba and re-enter China's internet sector overall. Furthermore, the primary listing in Hong Kong could become the Alibaba representative share class in global indices should trading volume rise appropriately. The average trading volume in uh, the company's Hong Kong listed shares is likely to rise from the current $0.7 billion a day closer to the New York volume of $3 billion. Um, uh, Tencent already has this privilege. It hasn't helped Tencent much, by the way, yet, uh, but that's going to change. And, you know, further liquidity is a positive thing. But I think there have been a lot of people uh, in mainland China that wanted to own Alibaba for a long time. So it may be more pent up than uh, was the case with Tencent. Uh, and it could be happening at the exact right time with some of the other things that are happening. Ant Group executives exit Alibaba partnership as fintech unit seeks regulatory green light. Seven Ant executives, include, including Chairman and Chief Executive Eric Jin Zhaidong, were no longer Alibaba partners as of May 31st. Separately, Alibaba said on Tuesday it is seeking a primary listing on Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So what they're doing here is setting the stage for Ant to be fully separate from Alibaba, even though Alibaba owns 33% of the company, um, in order to set the table for the IPO. Uh, this crackdown ended with the uh, uh, pulling of the started with the pulling of the IPO, and I think it will end with the pulling of the IPO. As we saw rumblings last month that they were filing paperwork uh, to the effect, and uh, and I think we're seeing the actions taken, having the uh, board of uh, the, the Amp Financials board add the lady who ran the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, added to her board was also a tell. So more indications that were moving in that direction. This was the letter from the uh, chairman and CEO letter to shareholders uh, talking about their strategies forward. The other thing that someone pointed out, which I also thought was interesting, um, is that they're reporting on August 4th. Uh, let's see. Let's see if that was a formal announcement, actually, because oftentimes people say that they're reporting on the 4th and then it's much later. Um, no, they are reporting on the 4th. That is like almost a month earlier than they normally report. So, you know, people are speculating maybe that's bullish. Why would they come out a month earlier than normal? Uh, I guess we're going to find out on August 4th. So we'll look forward to that. Hong Kong seeks primary stock listing for Stock Connects to access wider and more diversified investor base. Uh, has received a approval from uh, to add in Hong Kong as another primary listing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all positive. Next, China plans three-tier data strategy to avoid U.S. delistings. Uh, again, they denied that, but obviously this is going from credible sources. This is the Financial Times, not you know someone's blog. So um, uh, my guess is that this is actually happening. Um, and that's a good thing. China Central Bank seeks to mobilize $148 billion bailout for real estate projects. So that's positive. Uh, Biden will speak to Xi on Thursday. He spoke to Xi and basically Xi told him, uh, you know, don't interfere if, um, you know, don't send Pelosi. And if you do, uh, you could get burned. So the, the call obviously didn't go well. Um, Unlike previous administrations, Biden got no orders for Boeing planes. Uh, he did nothing to change the dynamics of the tariff issue. So everything he was set out to accomplish on the call was an abysmal failure. Uh, and, um, and that's that. 
So um, I liked, <laughs> I liked, I, you know, Zero Hedge had this uh, headline out today that said, um, GDP goes negative for the second consecutive quarter. Here we go. Welcome to, welcome to the Biden recession. GDP unexpectedly sinks to uh, nine tenths of a percent, second consecutive dis decline. Quote, we did it, Joe. So there you go. Uh, Jack Ma to reportedly cede control of Ant Group, seen as a boost for Alibaba's stake. Uh, Jack Ma, co-founder and former executive chairman of Alibaba, is ready to cede control of Ant Group, according to a report with the Wall Street Journal. The fintech giant is looking to reduce its dependency on Jack Ma as it works with the government to overhaul its business. The Chinese government targeted Jack Ma in a bid to reduce its influence on the company. That, that was last year. Ant hopes... Ant hopes that by reducing the influence of Ma, it will be able to finally go public. The company was supposed to be valued at over $300 billion had it gone pub public earlier. Uh, Jack Ma's absence from Ant Group should not affect operations, but it could expedite IPO plans, according to Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Catherine Lim. Ma owns 50.52% of Ant's shares. He's basically going to cede his voting control, but keep, keep his economic interests. Smart guy. Uh, this can help realize the value of Alibaba's 30%, 33% uh, holding in Ant Financial. Lim added. Uh, okay, the company has already informed regulators about Ma's intentions while it, looks, while it works to become a financial holding company. Regulators have given their blessing. Okay, so that's that uh, moves in the right because that is we're getting zero credit for that as holders of uh, of Alibaba, uh, and that will be a one trillion dollar company one day, and Baba owns a third of that. So that's that's going to be a major play. That's uh, zero credit embedded today. Alibaba, Mindtron are top picks at Daiwa in sector upgrade as internet stocks to benefit the most from China stimulus. Daiwa upgraded online platform providers traded on Hong Kong markets to overweight from neutral. The so-called platform economy, economy is one of the most promising areas for policymakers to boost growth, say Daiwa research analysts. So again, opinions following trend had bottomed in March. Now people are starting to come around. Um, we view the internet sector as a key beneficiary for, of policy stimulus and loosening regulations, thus anticipating improving earnings visibility from uh, 2H 2022 uh, Second half 2022 onwards amid the economic cyclical uptrend. Uh, and you can read that on your own. So China bulls say July slide is a blip as worst is over for the stocks. Um, okay, so now moving on to the U.S. U.S. economy shrinks for a second consecutive quarter. We got the technical recession in the rearview mirror. That is great news. Bad news is good news. Market is a discounting mechanism. It did a great job of discounting this recession with the S&P off 20%, NASDAQ off 30% at the lows, actually 22 and 30 plus. Uh, and now that's recovering as it's going to start to anticipate the pivot, which started yesterday, which basically said 75 basis points was uh, was the peak is what basically uh, Powell intimated uh, they would be low, lower moving forward. I would not be surprised. I, I would I would I would assign a 20 percent probability, not more. But and this is this is non consensus, a 20 percent probability that that was the last hike of the cycle. And uh, all we need for that between now and September is some clear indications that inflation is slowing. Uh, if not, we'll have 50 or 25 in September and that'll be it. But um, but this is good news. And just as the market started crashing, actually tech stocks last February anticipating this slowdown uh, and the general market in the first six months of this year, you're going to start to see the market now pricing in the recovery moving forward and in an accelerated way uh, once the Fed actually uh, fully pivots. So, uh, yeah, the market is up quite a bit. 47 on the S&P, so that's probably about uh 350 400 on on the dow so uh bad news is good news here at 3 p.m on uh thursday so uh that's that is the dollar about to take a turn we have been uh saying this will happen by the end of the year uh this is the critical component to seeing uh the um 
emerging markets, i.e. the heaviest weight China, just absolutely taking off, ripping beyond all the other good things that are happening is a weakening in the dollar. And that's going to be a function of um, the, okay, so th this is the headline. If economy and inflation weaken, which we're seeing the, the former is weakening, the latter we believe is weakening based on what we've been talking about for the last two months with commodities. Now we'll start to see it in CPI. And now with the auto chips coming through, uh, used car prices are going to collapse as that new car supply comes online. Ford and GM maintain their guidance. We'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, but the Fed's likely to pause. I think this was potentially the last hike. If not, uh, it's the highest hike and it'll be 25 or 50 in September and then the game is over. So uh, that will be the pivot and that's when the market can rip. Um, Fed could lose its nerve. Uh, watch. Uh, that's not the interview I wanted. The interview I wanted was the one with uh, Jeffrey Gunlack. Here we go. Uh, the bond, the current bond king, the old bond king was was unequivocally Bill Gross. Uh, the Fed is no longer behind the curve, says Double Line CEO Jeff Gunlack. That was a great interview. Uh, check that out. We agree. Uh, and by the way, the Fed funds rate now is effectively 225, 250, which is the same level that they peaked at uh, in 2019 before they pivoted. Uh, and uh, and we think this could be the exact same situation because debt to GDP is higher and the servicing of that debt has become more burdensome. So um, investors bet Fed will need to cut interest rates next year to bolster the economy. We've been saying that for some time. Uh, it took eight months from the last 75 basis point cut in 1984. So figure, uh, what is this, uh, July, so June, yeah, I mean, could be the first quarter of next year. We could start to see cuts. Uh, is Biopharma bottoming? This is the institutional investor. Uh, and um, so so these guys are starting to get in the, on the game. Remember, China bottomed in March. So you're seeing more of the sell side firms get interested in China three months later. Um, biotech, and not three months, three plus uh, four months. Uh, and then biotech bottomed in May. So now more more firms are starting to get interested. That will accelerate. We've seen the half dozen deals, multi-billion dollar deals. Those will continue through the summer. The key thing now is drug approvals uh, and those will start to happen. Uh, here's from Eric Savitz over at Barron's. Uh, Aaron, Amazon's June quarter will be bad. The question is what happens next? I'd be a buyer on any weakness after earnings tonight. Um, this, as I said on the claim and countdown, stock's been down 40% seven times in its history. It, it always works back up to new highs. This time will be no different. Uh, and uh, and I like this. So uh, pray that it goes down a lot and, um, and pick up some shares and don't look at them for the next three years. Uh, is my opinion, not advice. Go to hedgefundtips.com and click on terms. Okay. Um, Senate approves $280 billion bill to boost U.S. chip making technology. Nothing like curbing inflation with more spending in corporate welfare. Uh, Ford's profit rises on higher sales and more inventory. Uh, this is huge because what does that mean? It means the chips are coming in. They maintain their full year guidance, just like GM maintained their full year guidance. All the suppliers were nervous whether they would be able to do that after the shutdown in China in early Q2. Uh, the tide has changed from the people I talked to in the last, uh, since June, early June, so call it two months now. The chips are flowing in uh, better than expected. We saw it in the earnings from four chip companies so far. We're going to see more as we move forward. We'll cover that in the article of the week. Royal Caribbean's loss narrows as customers splurge on board. We agree with that theme uh, looking out three years. Automakers see some relief from chip shortages. This is from Ellen Chang over at the street. Thanks for including me in the article. Uh, Teva. Uh, Teva, we've had a nice little position just sitting there forever doing nothing. Tries to put an end to the opi opioid war wars. They uh, did a uh, national settlement of $4.25 billion. So that's in the rearview mirror. Now they can focus on the business. I think this could be another stock over the next three to five years that winds up being a multi-bagger. It'll be bumpy in, in the short term because they have to wrap all of this up. But uh, I, I think there's opportunity there. That was the biggest generic provider in, uh, in, in the world. 
Uh, they got hit with that stuff, and now, um, now they're back. So, uh, or get or getting close to back. So that's something to keep an eye on. And that alarm right there means that semiconductors are kicking ass today. Um, remember, no one wanted tech, and we kept saying value tech, China tech, biotech. Well, it's all happening, folks. It sometimes takes a little longer than expected, but it invariably always works out. Operating with increased intensity, Zuckerberg leads Meta into the next phase. Uh, I think this is a home run. We bought some long dated uh, uh, spreads out to 2024 this morning. Wish we could buy a lot more. There was just nothing we wanted to sell uh, to, to do it. But um, if the opportunity, you know, I, my gut tells me this is going to be the last time you're able to buy the stock this cheap ever again. Um, so, you know, I think I think you want to buy some Amazon shares on the cheap and I think you want to buy some Meta shares on the cheap. Uh, while you can and just tuck them away and don't think about them for the next three years. Uh, grocery bill inflation might have peaked. Okay, that's good. We keep talking about getting the commodity prices to the cash register. It works on a lag basis. GE posts higher earnings on recovery in aviation industry. We've been talking about this would be a huge play. We have a special situation with Rolls Royce that was dead money this year. Now they finally got the CEO replacement. Uh, Tufan Ergen Billigic. He's a BP veteran. Uh, this guy is highly qualified to run this business, and we think he's going to get ca caught up in the tailwinds of the aviation recovery and mint money uh, over the next three to five years. So uh, it's good to see some resolution on that front. Joe Manchin reaches deal with Chuck Schumer on energy, health care, and tax package. So, um, and the quote of the day, Charlie Munger, I can't give you a formulaic approach because I don't use one. I just mix all the factors and if the gap between value and price is not attractive i go on to something else and sometimes it's just a quantitative it's just quantitative for instance when costco was selling for 12 or 13 times earnings i thought that it was a ridiculously low value just because the competitive strength of the business was so great and it was so likely to keep doing better and better but i can't reduce that to a formula for you i like the cheap real estate I liked the competitive position. I liked the personnel system. I liked everything about it. And I thought even though it's three times book or whatever it was then, uh, that it's worth more. But that's not a formula. If you want a formula, you should go back to graduate school. They'll give you lots of formulas that won't work. Charlie Munger, always, always laying it out straight. Uh, this is from Ryan Dietrich, another sign of extreme capitulation in late June. Love this chart from JP Morgan, showed a record. 12% of companies were trading beneath cash and short-term investments. You don't see that every day. When do you see it? You saw it in 2009. You saw it in 2003. Generational buy opportunities and uh, what we've been talking about in the last couple of months. Ant Group Executives Exit Alibaba Partnership as FinTech Unit Seeks Regulatory Green Light. We talked about that as it related to the IPO. The better than feared stock market and sentiment results. This was the article of the week. I got a lot of incredible feedback on this one. Uh, Philip Vassiliou, the CIO of Legatum. Remember the interview we did just a couple weeks back. You can watch it here. Uh, the brothers, uh, Chris and Richard, turned $10 million into $5 billion over 20 years. Philip's a partner with Christopher at Legatum. Um, he's thoughtfully sent me this great note on Wednesday written by another investing legend, Howard Marks. And I've read Howard's notes over the years. Uh, he's a, a famous distressed investor. And this one was one of the best. And, and the most important lines for me were, quote, unconventional behavior is the only road to superior investment results, but it isn't for everyone. In addition to superior skill, Successful investing requires the ability to look wrong for a while and survive some, some, some mistakes. While it's been nice to see Alibaba bottom in March and biotech bottom in May, it's been a long and unpopular road. There will be some who, quote, jump ship just before the money starts to pour in. There will be some who already sold in the hole and will buy back both, when, both of these investments 
when they have already doubled and then sell on the first 15% consolidation pullback because they're the Johnny come lately's late money to the trade. And there will be some that hold through and make many multiples of their money in a non-linear fashion. When it comes, it comes all at once. And I can tell you that returns are lumpy when you're talking about multi-baggers. Uh, so I know because I've been to this movie many times before and it has a very happy ending. The problem I've seen is that there are only a few people left in the theater to benefit from the happy ending, as most great movies all begin with a very rocky start prior to culminating in a happy resolution. That's the, that's the Hollywood formula. This time will be no different. So Marx goes on to say, thus, each person has to assess whether he's temperamentally equipped to do these things and whether his circumstances in terms of employers, clients, and the impact of other people's opinions will allow it. When the chips are down and the early going makes him look wrong, as it, inevi as it inevitably will, you can't have it both ways. Mark's line, quote, you can't have it both ways, is the key to the kingdom in this business, in my opinion. Outsized returns do not come to the faint of heart who, with no process of analysis, no staying power, and no stomach for short-term noise or volatility. You simply can't have it both ways. As I like to say, they don't give away multi-baggers for free. You have to earn them, and sometimes with a few gray hairs. I'll give you the most extreme example I've seen. About 14 years ago, Charlie Munger convinced Warren Buffett that Berkshire Hathaway should buy 10% of a Chinese battery maker called BYD. They paid $230 million for 10% of the company. Today, the market cap of BYD is about $130 billion, which implies their $230 million became $13 billion over 14 years. Let me explain to you why this is so significant. And you can see this chart. The stock did absolutely nothing from 2008 to 2000, mid-2020. And uh, what's also interesting that you don't notice from this chart is that um, you had, uh, after they bought the stock, uh, went up to $11, and then it immediately collapsed to $1.45, almost 90% collapse uh, over the next year and a half. Then it shot back up to $10 over the next uh, seven years, and then it collapsed back to a dollar, 90% drawdown, is that a dollar or five dollars? So they had a 90% drawdown and it looks like about a 60% drawdown uh, after 12 years of doing nothing. Uh, and then what happened? All the returns happened in the last two years. So it's significant because they were wrong for the first 11 and a half years of their investment. Every index, manager, ETF, moron, day trader, psychic, astrologist, tarot card reader, chartist, and even a few good investors outperformed the hell out of this investment for more than a decade. Who would stick with such a ridiculous failure of an investment? Well, someone who knows what the hell they're doing, that's who. Someone who did the work, that's who. And someone who knew what they owned, that's who. And here are the financial statements during that period when the business was doing nothing. We have here just from 2012 to 2020, the top line, uh, uh, not tripled from 45 billion to 150 billion dollars, and the stock did nothing. Uh, operating income went from looks like 5.9 billion up to 10 billion. Then you had uh, net income went from 212 million to six billion dollars. So the business was improving, the stock was doing nothing. And while the stock did nothing for 12 years and everything outperformed them, the business fundamentals improved consistently. This is one of the most extreme examples I've seen of a stock taking time to catch up to the underlying fundamentals, but it always does sooner or later. This is one, this one did to the tune of 56 X or a 56 bagger. You don't hear that every day. 10 baggers all day long, 56 bagger. Don't hear that often. It's also a 33.4% compound annual growth rate for the holding period. Almost 100% of those returns came in the last two years. So when Jeff Bezos asked Warren Buffett one time, if what you do is so simple, why doesn't everyone do it? And to that, Buffett replied, because no one wants to get rich slow. And that's the key reason, guys. And uh, people are impatient and they never get to benefit from these life-changing events um, I was at the annual meeting in 2009 
uh, actually had the privilege. We flew out. Um, uh, my boss at that time was is good friends with uh, Mario Gabelli. We flew out on Mario Gabelli's Citation 10. It was my first time in a private jet. Those things go really fast. I don't, I don't know that that's still the fastest one out there, but uh, uh, it was unbelievable. And uh, when they announced this investment and Buffett's sell side trader to, from Chicago told me to buy how to buy it in Hong Kong. Uh, when we were having a, a, a drink at the lobby of the, the hotel across the street from the convention center, it's like it's either the Hilton or the Sheraton. I can't remember. I was there this summer too for the Olympic trials. I brought my daughters out, same hotel. Um, anyway, uh, so he told me how to buy it in Hong Kong and guess what I did? I passed. And the question is at that stage in my learning process, would I have, I, would I have had the fortitude to hold an improving business, even though the price was not confirming the fundamentals for 11 years. And at that stage in my learning process, the answer is no. Um, but at this stage, the answer is resounding, resounding yes. And, and uh, we've, we've had uh, a, a number of uh, multi-baggers, not 56 baggers, but uh, some, some, some nice investments over the years. Now, a couple million would have been worth uh, 130 million today. So that was a costly, uh, costly decision. It couldn't have been teed up more perfectly for me. Speaking of teed up, I want to thank Paul Smith, who sent me this incredible uh, book uh, this week. He's been an avid listener and supporter of the podcast for a number of years now. He's a retired uh, 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 trooper in in, uh, in Pennsylvania, and he sent me, uh, you know, a uh, uh, ball divot repair, uh, which was amazing, and his card in case I get pulled over going, you know, 100 miles an hour in one of those cars. And then, um, and a nice letter. So just incredibly thoughtful and it makes things real. You know, we put out this hard work every single week and I'm very grateful for that acknowledgement and uh, so looking forward to finishing this book. I've already started it. It's, it's amazing. Um, okay, moving on. So that one cost $130 million. Um, the key is to never make the same mistake twice. When I own a quality business that continues to improve over time, I don't sell regardless of outside pressures and opinions or short-term price. That philosophy has served me well over the years. I made a similar case on Alibaba on December 30th of last year, so seven, eight, eight months ago. The stock price was $116 when we put out that article. Our basis was much higher. We've been fortunate to bring our blended basis down to $122 by buying massive options in the hole when the famous JP Morgan quote, China is uninvestable report came out in March and the stock tanked. But we're still underwater on the position and most people would say wrong with all capital letters. But most people would be unwilling to burden themselves with the facts we laid out in that note. So you can click here on the note from J December 28th. Uh, this was the key point we made in the note, which has not changed. From 2014 to 2021, seven full years, Alibaba grew revenues per share by 894%, cash flow per share by 559%, and earnings per share by 601%. Over the same seven years, while the business grew many multiples, 500 to 900%, depending which metric you emphasize, the stock price gained 0%. Zero, zilch, nada. You can see it visually here. The IPO, this was 2014 prices. 2016 prices, and we're back to those IPO prices. The difference is the business is seven to eight hundred percent better than it was. As Ben Graham said, in the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it is a weighing machine. Because we know what we own, we added more stock, uh, knowing we can own one of the highest quality businesses in the world with a defensible moat. We're buying a business that has grown five to nine times for the 2014 price it traded at before all of the growth. So here is uh, Alibaba Financials, just so you can visualize it. Uh, we've gone over this many times, but you know, you're paying, so it did 52 billion in revenue in 2014. Uh, it did 850 billion last year, and you're paying the same price for the business. So tell me how that makes sense. It doesn't make any sense. But did this make sense? Did it make sense that Alibaba, that uh, BYD for 12 years, business went from 45 billion in revenue to 150 billion dollars in revenue and the stock did nothing and then all of a sudden it was a 56 bagger in a year and a half when the money comes it comes all in once all at once trust me i've been to this movie before and uh and that's exactly where we are so i wanted to give you that visualization um 
According to the brilliant short-term thinkers who rarely make any real money over time, we are, quote, wrong, just like Munger and Buffett were while the fundamentals of BYD grew, but the stock price did nothing. Like Marx referenced, we are, quote, temperamentally equipped to see it through as price, the voting machine, always catches up with the fundamentals, the weighing machine, sooner or later. In this case, we expect it sooner, sooner as a number of catalysts are lining up in that direction in the near term, which we've just covered uh, in the early part of this podcast. Uh, thanks to Ellie Tarrant and Ashley Webster for having me on Fox Business on Friday. This we went through the advertising business, Meta, Snap, uh, etc. The other thing that we said before the whatever it was, 600 point rally yesterday and 400 point rally today is that no one is positioned for any good news, geopolitical inflation or guidance. Cash levels are the highest since 9-11. Recession fears are the highest since April 2020 uh, and March 2009. Uh, both of which were lows in the market. Stock market's a discounting mechanism. So while we may be in or will have a recession, the market will bottom before it's declared. Uh, managers will have to chase up and panic by any further unexpected strength. Here's the key that I said on Friday, and you should play the video if you have a minute. If GDP comes in negative for Q2, consistent with the Atlanta GDP now, it may be a relief rally as it will be viewed as, quote, in the rear view mirror versus a dreaded when is it coming as it relates to the recession. And that's exactly what's happened. Uh, negative GDP print could also be the impetus for the Fed to slow down or pause pivot as early as September, which we covered earlier, provided we begin to see lower commodity prices filtering through to the cash register in coming weeks and months, which we believe we'll see. The Cheddar interview was 12 minutes about all the tech companies, the recession, definitely a worthwhile watch thanks to Asia and um, uh, Ali Thompson and Ellie Park. And then thanks again to Ellie Terrett and Liz Clayman and Finley Walker for having me on again on Tuesday. Uh, we were talking after Walmart got crashed for uh, discounting inventory, which we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks was gonna be happening across the board. We've seen it, in, this is disinflationary. The other news that's disinflationary was NXPI, Taiwan Semiconductor, uh, Qualcomm, and uh, Texas Instrument all reporting that their auto chip business is booming in Q2, uh, which means the Ford and GM were able to maintain their production guidance for this year, along with IHS uh, talking about uh, global car production will be 80, 80 million. They uh, reaffirmed that this, this past month, uh, which means that uh, chip suppliers are gonna do uh, auto suppliers are going to start to do great and, and benefit from the operating leverage. That is a major component of CPI. As used car prices collapse, you can see how elevated they got during the pandemic uh, and during the chip shortage. As those collapse, that's a major heavyweight component in GDP. You're going to see in uh, in CPI, which is going to help CPI to roll over in coming months as well. We also talked about Amazon, which is getting the retail exposure without the risk, because if you buy AWS in the ad business, which is doing $45 billion in operating income this year, you get the online uh, retail business, e-commerce business, Whole Foods business, and Prime business all for free for a limited time offer after earnings tonight. If, they, uh, if you get some weakness, I think it's an opportunity. IMF uh, downgraded global GDP. And I said, it reiterated, if uh, negative GDP print for Q2 this week is a technical recession, uh, you could see a pivot from the Fed, which is bullish, bring record institutional cash off the sidelines, highest since 9-11, according to BOA. Uh, as we're already in a recession, the market is a discounting mechanism and we'll start to look forward to recovery after the recession. Bad news could be good news, and that's what we're seeing today. So we called that one. Uh, we continue to focus on sectors that can perform in a slower growth environment like biotech, which is now up 30% off its May lows. The key drivers are the FDA back to, uh, to drug approvals, number two, animal spirits with the deals, and number three, uh, decade multi-decade low valuations. Now, the Fed, as anticipated, they raised 75 basis points and stated that further moves would be data dependent. It was no coincidence that the CBO published its debt sustainability report an hour or so before the Fed announcement, along with this chart, uh, with their estimates of uh, uh, federal debt. So they made the following statement, debt that is high and rising as a percentage of GDP could slow economic growth, highest since World War II, by the way, push up interest payments to foreign holders of U.S. debt, heighten the risk of a financial crisis, and elevate the likelihood of less abrupt 
uh, adverse effects, making the U.S. fiscal position more vulnerable to an increase in interest rates and cause lawmakers to feel more constrained by the policy choices. In other words, expect above trend inflation for the foreseeable future. Not only must the Fed hold rates lower to keep servicing payments manageable, the only way to, quote, pay it back, uh, which no government has ever done in history, is to inflate it away as a percentage of GDP. Make nominal growth hum. And this is a similar strategy to what succeeded post-World War II. Debt to GDP collapsed through above-trend inflation and nominal growth, uh, and this time will be no different, which is why they are more focused on inflation expectations than they are actual inflation. They need above-trend inflation, not 9%, but certainly 3 to 3.5% 3 over the next handful of years, uh, and that will be not only accepted, but welcomed. So if you see the pivot before inflation gets to 3% or 4%, now you know why. Uh, the key is these expectations have already rolled over. It's also no coincidence that Treasury Secretary Yellen is scheduled to hold an economic press conference after the Q2 GDP number is released today. If negative, she will explain how two quarters of negative GDP no longer means a recession for the first time in history. Uh, the market is smarter than that and will likely celebrate the fact that two quarters of the recession are already finished and begin to discount the economic recovery coming six to nine months out when the Fed begins cutting rates once again. Managers with record cash on the sidelines will have to panic in and performance chase if that scenario plays out. That scenario played out today. Uh, so you can see their cash levels <coughs> in a visual. If the GDP print is positive, Yellen will take a victory lap and the market will likely be subdued, wondering when the next recession will actually arrive. In short, bad news will likely be good news and, and vice versa. It's opposite day. And that's exactly what happened. Bad news was good news and it, and it played out as anticipated. Auto chips, our third largest position, which we've discussed on previous podcast video casts, Cooper Standard, is a special situation auto supplier. There are two catalysts. One is the chips coming in, which has now happened. The second is credit markets reopening, which is going to happen as the, the, the way to solve the credit markets is the equity markets to rally. As the equity markets rally into the second half, in, into the end of the year, what you're going to see is credit markets reopen, they'll get refinanced, and the stock will just uh, uh, catalyst up. Again, this could be a donut hole. Uh, there's no question about it. They've got 16 months to refinance the small debt. But keep in mind, the quarter after the pandemic, before the chip shortage started, uh, they did 30 or $40 million of EBITDA. So by the time they need the money, they may not even need the money. They can pay it out of cash. So, um, uh, and, you, and the way life works is when you don't need the money, they give you the money. Uh, and, and, um, and now maybe they'll be getting it at a lower interest rate. So, uh, all of that's good. Uh, its existence, uh, its existence depends on the number of cars the OEMs produce with its two largest clients being Ford and GM. We have received very good news on this front in a mosaic of recent earnings report indicating the tide has shifted as it relates to auto chip supply improving. This was a core tenet in our investment thesis, which is now starting to manifest. Taiwan Semiconductor auto chip business up 14% uh, year on year. NXPI Semiconductor auto chip business up 36% year on year. Texas Instrument beat and raised on strength in industrial and auto chips. Uh, auto chips rose 20% year on year. Qualcomm automotive chips grew 38% on an annual basis, an all-time high for Qualcomm. Why this is also important is their handset and electronic chips, which everyone was buying during the pandemic, for computers have collapsed. So they can they can reallocate some of that capacity to auto chips. And just as we are seeing a uh, what is nearing a glut in, in uh, electronics chips, we're going to see a glut in car chips as well. And uh, the suppliers that sell parts to the OEMs that are getting the chips and now shipping the cars to the dealers so they can book it as revenues, uh, it's going to be a home run. So GM said this is going to happen because they maintain their full year guidance and production Despite the setback in early Q2 due to the China lockdowns, Ford did the exact same thing last night. In a research report published on Sunday, RBC analyst Joseph Spack wrote that some auto suppliers he follows have seen supply chain situations improve. What's more, forecasting firm IHS kept its prediction of about 80 million global cars. That's up from the trough, uh, pandemic trough of 65 million. So we're coming back in a serious way for the full year 2022 earlier this month despite volume slipping uh, out of the second quarter because of uh, problems in China. GM and Ford are key. 
They can only book revenue when they send the car to dealers. They can only send the car to dealers when they have auto chips. The color is now that the tide has changed. The latter part of Q2 and chips are flowing again. This is critical for auto suppliers as they get paid when OEMs are shipping cars and OEMs can ship cars if they have chips. Okay, so I repeated myself only six times on that one, but uh, that's what happens when you finish an article at six in the morning. The machine is now unclogging and two years of unfulfilled backlog cannot st now start to be filled. The operating leverage will be enormous. Uh, earnings are better, coming in better than feared. 68% uh, beat rate so far on the top line. 65%, I'm sorry, 68% beat rate on the bottom line. 65% on the top line. We'll see the new numbers tomorrow from FactSet. Uh, fear is still there, which is a beautiful formula for the market to push higher, climb the wall of worry. Bullish uh, retail investors were only 27% down from 29 last week. Bearish were at 40%, also down 2%. So more people are moving into the neutral camp from abject fear. Uh, fear and greed is still at fear. 38 ticked down from 39 last week. That's a great setup. And uh, uh, active investment managers are still dramatically underweight uh, equities at 44.48%. This week, they'll have to chase all the way back up to full exposure uh, or have career risk into year end. Uh, okay, we went through Alibaba's numbers. Economic calendar key indicators. Um, consumer confidence missed again. So again, these are all things that point to the Fed, Fed pausing. New home sales were weak. Case Shiller showed uh, home prices softening. That's good for inflation. Um, we saw, by the way, China's industrial profit came in much better than uh, the previous print. So they're coming out of their uh, Q2 horror show uh, with some, some strength starting to show up. Uh, other key things, you had a big draw in crude. That's not good. Um, continuing jobless claims was better than expected. Uh, initial jobless claims was worse than expected, 256,000 versus 253,000 estimated. So again, that points to uh, potentiality for a pause. And then we'll see core PCE tomorrow. And we'll see the rig count, which, by the way, is now at 758. Pre-pandemic was at 790. So, again, you're going to see more and more of that U.S. production come online. It looks like, I mean, we'll see what happens in the coming weeks. But not only did, did Biden fail on the China call today, but it seems like he completely failed and embarrassed himself in the Saudi trip. I hope he proves me wrong and uh, we see start, some of that production start to flow up to that 13 million barrel a day production. But that's kind of embarrassing. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the fact that he came away with no orders, the last administration would have wrote an order for, you know, a hundred planes from the Chinese this morning on the phone call, but, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. So, you know, you take the good with the bad both on both sides, uh, earnings, you know, we, we went through that. Those have been strong, uh, estimates have come down modestly, uh, but not materially, uh, I think from 250 down to 247.8, so a couple bucks. People were saying it had to go to 230. I don't think that's gonna be the case. Uh, I think it's happened already in real terms. Um, uh, you know, you've got 9% inflation and they've stayed relatively flat. So uh, that's that arc. Uh, uh, Carter did the uh, top 30 weights. So the cumulative earnings power of these top 30 weights uh, has fallen from negative 74 to negative 75 so they're basically flat we do you know one sector and subsector a week now questions uh, Mikhail Bobkoff sent me a really interesting long email he's got a thesis for ASOS which is a growing e-commerce company based in the United Kingdom primarily selling apparel and I didn't expect there to be um, I didn't expect to be excited by it, but uh, I am actually after looking at it and I'm going to spend some more time on it this weekend or this week. Um, but if you look at the quality of the business, first off, this is an example, by the way, of number one, someone who's learned a lot listening to us over the last two years. Uh, number two is applying it. And number three um, is making himself very valuable to the marketplace. So... Uh, this is what a real analyst does, and uh, and this is just good work. Um, so here's the stock chart, okay? And it's gone to nothing. We've got to find out what's the short thesis. Why did it fall 90%? Uh, 
But um, if you look at revenues, they've grown from 238 million in 2012 to 3.9 billion. They've gone up every single year um, and the stock price is now trading lower. The balance sheet, as far as I noted from his uh, note, is, is relatively healthy. I'll have to double check that over the weekend. Operating in income has grown. Um, net income has grown materially. Uh, let's just see some of these ratios. Return on equity. Okay, so it's diminished a little bit. Return on capital is diminished a little bit, but this is all during the pandemic. All have been positive. Uh, gross margin has pretty much held up. I mean, this looks like a high quality business. I got to figure out like why do people think it's it's dead, and then um, figure out uh, you know if and how we want to get positioning on this. Um, but we won't know that yet. But I would say at first blush, good, good work, Macal. Uh, probably the best AMA question we've ever gotten so far. Um, all right. Uh, Drew says, Tom, really appreciate your video cast, especially good to hear your consistent, unemotional, data-driven content in these more turbulent markets. Do you think there's value in U.S. airlines, United Airlines, American Airlines, Delta, given their pandemic low valuations currently with their fundamentals, future travel catalysts justify this in your opinion? I think just buy the highest quality business that has the cleanest balance sheet and hold it for three years and don't think about it. The risk is obviously they have to raise it, raise capital and they issue more stock, but um, it's not the end of the world. Maybe buy a basket of them and, and forget about them. They'll work. Even the cruise lines that everyone's down on, they'll work. The issue is raising more capital and getting diluted. So it's not an all-in position because you know that that's coming and maybe some of that's already priced in. But uh, yeah, I like I like the whole thesis there, even with the mild recession, et cetera, et cetera, which is largely rear, rear view mirror, mirror looking. Appreciate their better place to allocate for anyone not already invested in tech, biotech, et cetera. Hope the swim meet went well and good luck with getting that par down. Uh, both are going well, by the way. The girls did unbelievable at the uh, age group or zones. I don't know. They're, we're going to Ithaca. It, like they're they're crushing it. They're working hard, so they get whatever they want because they're doing good work um, and they're earning it. And um, and the par's coming down. By the way, I took my third lesson with the pro, who's a stack and tilt guy. And um, unbelievable, he changed one thing. I was bending down too much. He just told me, to, you know, bend from the hips forward, a couple things and like flying wedge with the wrist hinge, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just puring everything. So I'm going to play tonight after, well, for nine. And then we got the birthday celebration and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but so, so we'll see how it goes on the course. But uh, played nine in central Connecticut uh, after the girls swim meet. And uh, it, it best nine holes, and that was before the lesson. So uh, it's moving in the right direction. I'm having fun. Uh, last is, and the most important thing is, I'm not touching my core position so they can turn into multi baggers. Uh, that's the name of the game. Uh, Bill says, "Love your Tom. Love your content. Really appreciate your insights. I'm a Chinese stock investor. I understand if certain Chinese stocks are delisted in the U.S., they can trade." on other listed foreign exchanges, but I haven't been able to figure out where the options will trade. Neo, for example, do you have any idea? Um, well, the options won't. So you got to exercise those uh, if that comes to pass, which I don't think will, but it's possible that it will. Uh, so you would exercise it into stock and then convert the stock out to Hong Kong shares. And you can just do that over time slowly, but surely uh, and um, and benefit from that. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.